glad to see everybody here. It's nice to, you know, that we found our way to Zoom and help us uh, get through these challenging times that we're living in. And <clears throat> I'm grateful that Rebecca Bradshaw has um, answered yet another invitation with Common Ground to give a Dharma talk. Uh, Rebecca has been giving Dharma talks at Common Ground, usually around the TCBC retreat, well, often twice a year, coming in February for the TCBC uh, retreat, and then usually again to see her mom sometime in the summer. And usually she stops by Common Ground to do a little teaching both occasions. But now that <clears throat> we're not meeting in person and Rebecca's doing an online retreat, we have her here on Zoom with us, which is really a wonderful treat. So I have the good fortune, great pleasure to introduce Rebecca tonight. Rebecca is one of my teachers and has been a really important mentor for me for the last um, at least four years and a little bit longer now. Um, she is one of the guiding teachers at Insight Meditation Society and a former guiding teacher of Insight Pioneer Valley. And she was, how long were you the guiding teacher there, Rebecca, doing both things? Uh, 20 years at um, what is now the Insight Meditation Center of Western Massachusetts. Right. Thank you yeah. for that correction. Yep. So 20 years in Dharma service concurrently with IMS and formerly IPV. So just a wonderful, a wonderful um, example of, yeah, just putting her practice in motion, setting her practice in motion and offering it out to the world in so many ways. And she continues to teach retreats at all over, um, and especially at IMS, is about to be at the Forest Refuge for a month in March. So you can um, find Rebecca's Dharma teaching um, by Googling her. And she's got a website, Rebecca Bradshaw Meditation.org. Is that right? Um, Rebecca Bradshaw.org. Rebecca Bradshaw.org. I'll put it in the chat for us. Um, and you can find her listed at, at IMS quite a lot. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for being here with us and for, for so many years coming back and um, finding your finding your way to your other home at Common Ground and in Minneapolis here. Mm. Yeah. I'll turn it on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just have to say it's been such a delight to know Shelly and to be participating with her at the IMS uh, teacher training um, program that she graduated from last year. And um, uh, I always love connecting with Minneapolis, even if it's by Zoom, because uh, many of you know that I was born and lived my first uh, 18 years there. So I keep tabs on like, I know you guys just went going through a cold snap, maybe almost about to pull out of it a little bit, but not too much. Um, and then Zoom is such a surprise. My mom's on with us tonight. I didn't know she was gonna be here. So that's kind of fun. Um, uh, my mom lives uh, north of the cities just a little bit. And, um, usually I come in uh, February and um, and uh, stop by and visit her, but it's been a couple years now. Anyway, lovely to be with you all. And the topic tonight is freeing the heart. Um, I think it's interesting. We talk a lot about freeing the mind, um, but how often do we frame it as freeing the heart? And in um, Buddhism, the word for mind and heart or in Pali languages is the same word, it's chitta. And we always, almost always translate it as mind and we talk a lot about freeing the mind, but um, I love to talk about giving equal time to freeing the heart. So that's what we'll be focusing on tonight. And um, we can go right into our meditation where I will give some um, instructions around this relating to the heart. So we can uh, settle in. In our sacred space, wherever you are is your sacred space. We don't, we're not just going to be in one sacred space tonight, we're going to be in 60. So we can feel the collective power of that. But there's six to about 60 of us all in our own um, po uh, sacred space, our, our meditation spot. 
with this intention to free the heart. And it's always good to start with just taking a moment to drop into the body with all our attention on the mind, our, our energy can be quite um, high, somewhere around the head or above it. And so we start to let it drop in. Perhaps we can even scan as we drop down, just noticing any place perhaps that we're holding on that we want to invite to relax. Maybe the forehead, we can allow it to widen just a little bit. And the eyes too settle back. Don't have to work right now. And the jaw to drop. Just a little bit, tongue to relax, face. It's just an invitation, and as much as it wants to take, it will, you know, of course, or demands. Just a simple little suggestion that we can let go of any extra tension. We can allow the neck to relax by lengthening. And it, one way you can help that is just tuck the chin just a little bit. You might notice how the neck lengthens and relaxes. Allowing the shoulders to both drop and broaden a little bit. They relax in two ways, dropping and broadening. Inviting a softness in the chest and down into the abdomen. Perhaps the back, the lower back may be willing to release just a little bit towards the floor, drop just a little bit. We tend to hold extra energy there. And feeling the contact with the cushion or the chair. The legs and feet and the floor and the earth below us. Sustaining us, holding us so that we can relax. Perhaps we feel the movement of the breath. We find ourselves present here on earth as an alive human being. We can feel this aliveness through our whole body. Energizing us for presence, for curiosity. Well, this combination that we could call relaxed enthusiasm. Settled alertness. And 
ready to meet however life manifests. Moment by moment. So some of you will choose to have this anchor experience that you connect with and come back to the breath or the body sitting, hands touching. And you'll notice the other experiences that arise, connect, and then come back to the anchor. Others of you might have a more open practice where you connect moment by moment with whatever is happening. Choosing which one is skillful right now. Sometimes we need that anchoring to help us settle. Sometimes we need the openness. Have the presence to be able to connect with this kind of openness. One way we free the heart is by not having expectations or demands for how life manifests. And so if you notice any judgment or expectation, demand, see if you can let it go and come back to what is true right now. What is my experience right now? Because that's what we connect with and that's what teaches us. We're scattered, we come back to our anchor simply. Appreciating that we're present.
our meditation practice, we can check in with the heart. We're so busy in our lives that we seldom take the chance to just rest our attention with the heart and see, see what we're feeling. It might be calm, equanimity, peace, grief, fear, restlessness. Love, joy, sorrow. Anger, this full range of the human heart. You might be numb, blah. Whatever you encounter, whatever is true. We allow and connect with it just as it is. So there's a, a mind manifestation sometimes with these different feelings. We can notice that thoughts, stories, beliefs. And then there's the embodied presence of that emotion. Often we feel it in our heart center, but we might feel it in the abdomen or anywhere in the body, the neck, face. So we connect with this mind state or emotion in the body. Whatever we notice, it might be very subtle, it might be stronger. Again, there's no demands that we notice anything particular of any particular intensity. The heart frees itself through allowing, through connection with awareness. So how much space is there in your being for whatever emotion may be present? How do we hold it? That's actually the most important question, not what's present, but how is it being held? Is there any tension or intention to control it, manage it, make it be some way or the other, keep it, get rid of it? Not like it, want it. Or is there space? I think of it as space. Is there space to allow? No right answer. Again, we connect with whatever the truth is. Perhaps we notice there's some contraction around this mind state and then it opens up and we notice there's space. What's, what's the difference between these two experiences? Perhaps it doesn't open up what's that experience like. So 
So I used a lot of words, but the exploration itself is actually one of feeling. Embodied feeling. Moment to moment connection. And of course, thoughts arise and um, that's okay. We can just come back to the body. Maybe we start feeling scattered, so we come back to our anchor to help settle. Gather the attention. Perhaps it gets super intense and we then move away. Maybe feel our feet on the floor. Stand up. Open our eyes. Look around. So yes, sometimes some management is useful when we feel out of balance. And then when we feel gathered and curious and strong, we connect again. Is there space for this to be? No need to go looking if nothing is really obvious. We can just continue with our practice as we are accustomed to doing. Again, no expectations.
One student described the differences as holding an emotion in our rib cage or our rib basket. We learn to hold emotion from the rib basket, that open space of allowing. We can end our meditation this evening by taking a moment to appreciate this vibrant, alive human body that feels life, that's connected to life through feeling, intimately embedded in this world. And with the hope and the prayer that our practice can be a benefit to ourselves, to our families, friends, and community, and that the benefits continue to spread outward and be of benefit to all beings everywhere. So I'm imagining it wouldn't be um, unhelpful to just have a couple minutes to stretch and uh, settle into a comfortable posture for our exploration together.
Again, so good to see you all here tonight. So I'll talk for, well, actually, before I talk, are there any questions about the instructions? I always like to give the opportunity. Um, people tend to be a little bit shyer on Zoom, but if you have anything you want to ask or anything you learned, um, we can take a couple minutes for that. You could probably raise your, you know, your Zoom hand if, if so. Okay, I don't see anybody. So I'll probably talk about a half hour and then we'll have some time for questions, discussions, um, thoughts. So I wanna start with um, a quote from Ajahn Chah, the, the um, Thai forest master, one of my favorite teachers. And one thing I like about him is in his translations, and I, and I would think that this has something to do with his instructions, in his translations of the Dharma, um, they almost always use heart instead of mind. And um, like I said, it kind of goes uh, against some of the tendencies that we see to use mind so much. So he says, listening to your own heart is really very interesting. This untrained heart races around following its own untrained habits. It jumps about excitedly, randomly, because it has never been trained. Therefore, train your heart. Buddhist meditation is about the heart. Developing the heart or mind, developing your own heart. This is very, very important. The training of the heart is the main emphasis. Buddhism is the religion of the heart. So in this talk, we'll be interested in then what is um, the training of the heart? Or another way we could say it is, how do we free the heart? How do we go from the rib cage to the rib basket? <laughs> Might be another way to say that. But I wanna start with um, some thoughts around freedom. And these thoughts come from um, a commercial. I'm always interested in what I call the anti-dharma. And I used to find the anti-dharma a lot when I was on airplanes, looking in airplane um, magazines at the advertisements usually, but not always. Uh, but I haven't been on the airplane for two months. So um, I did find though an anti-Dharma commercial. So this commercial opens with some people at a car and it says, um, this is what freedom sounds like. And, and they turn on the car. So this is what freedom sounds like, turn on the car. So the idea, obviously, is you get in the car and you can go wherever you want, and that's freedom. And then it says, this is what freedom smells like. And they put an air freshener in the car. So it was an air freshener commercial. So I was thinking, in this case, this is what freedom smells like. It's like mass freedom is masking what is unpleasant and covering it up with what's pleasant. So freedom is the ability to get away, go somewhere else, away from where we are, or freedom is the ability to mask or um, hide what's unpleasant, like unpleasant smells in the case of the air freshener and cover it up with pleasant. Anyway, this is the anti-dharma because this isn't how we look at freedom in Buddhism. In Buddhism, freedom is not found by going somewhere else, but by arriving fully right here. It's not about getting away, right? It's about arriving. And freedom's not about trying to cover up what's unpleasant or not so pretty and to only have things always look pretty or smell pretty, <laughs> but rather being able to open to the full range of pleasant and unpleasant, pretty and not so pretty, the whole catastrophe, you could say, of the human life. So 
So the, the goal of practice is um, the freedom of the unobstructed heart, the unobstructed mind, the unobstructed heart. I think about this a lot. What, what does this mean, the unobstructed heart, the unobstructed mind? Basically, what obstructs the heart? What blocks the heart, obstructs it? What makes the heart um, be confined in the rib cage? Because you could say the unobstructed heart is the unconfined heart, the free heart. So what obstructs the heart we find in our own practice? Greed, hatred, and delusion in Buddhism. Wanting, not wanting, and dulling out. So the unobstructed heart is the one that's free of greed, <laughs> hatred, and delusion. Because we can start to feel for ourselves, really feel this is not an intellectual exercise. But we can heal, feel, for example, that when we're wanting something, how does the heart feel? When we're wanting something, the heart feels like that, right? And when we don't want something, how does the heart feel? When we're trying to get rid of something, don't want it? It's the same, right? We're, we're... <laughs> you get it, right? <laughs> And and delusion, that's a whole, that's a, a different one. But basically, it you can feel it as an obstruction because life loses its vibrancy, it becomes dull. And the dullness actually obstructs and protects the heart. You could say that these three also protect the heart. They obstruct the heart, but they also protect the heart. They they actually separate the heart from, from life. And um, that's why we like them. <laughs> we kind of like them, right? We don't like them because we want to be connected, right? Isn't that our, most of us, if we really look, our deepest yearning is that we want to be connected to life. We want that vibrant engagement with life that really is alive and present. And yet we also want we want to be safe and protected, right? So greed protects us because greed is like, it, it protects us by, by giving the illusion that we can control and get pleasantness at will. And aversion protects us by giving us the illusion that we can control and get rid of what we don't want. And delusion protects us by closing us down. So we, we, we humans have a dilemma here. <laughs> we want openness, we want connectedness, we wanna be alive and embedded in this world. And we're not so sure sometimes. We're not so sure we want that much vulnerability because it's a wild world, it's wild. You've noticed, I assume. So, so, so we're practicing, how do we work with these, the protection of the heart, you could say, or the obstruction, I don't know, the word obstruction maybe is a little too um, adversarial. <laughs> maybe, maybe protection's a better word. So how do we how do we do that? Um, one way is just like we were doing in the instructions is like allowing. So we learn to start connecting and checking in with what's happening in the heart, the mind too, but but also the heart, the embodied heart. And we start to check in and just see what's happening. Right? It's great, like even at the end of this day, just taking a few minutes to sit down and have room for your heart to feel. 
It's free. I notice that some days if I'm like kind of grumpy and a little off, maybe feel like kind of bickering with my partner or something, <laughs> that often what I need to do is stop and, and see what my heart, you know, what's going on in the heart. And often when I do that, there is something that I haven't been wanting to feel that I've been kind of pushing away. And when I stop and give some space to that space, embodied space, then I'm, I'm usually much more present and I'm, I'm able to be present and I'm not so grumpy. So often a good sign that we actually need to stop and give our heart some space is, is when we are grumpy, irritable, pushy, not as kind as we'd like to be. So one way to free the heart is to allow it to have its own experience. We also mentioned that there is a time to um, manage that experience. So if we're being overwhelmed, like let's say we're overwhelmed with craving something and you know we it's it's kind of addictive for us, then yeah, we have to manage that heart. We we you know set limits. We 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 find ways to either distract or to ground. Um, Or if it's you know overwhelming aversion, anger, fear, and and we can't um, find enough, there isn't enough space for some interest and ability to to kind of play play with the emotion. That's another way to free the heart, play with the heart. Um, it can be good to yes, how do I find my stability? or maybe feeling the feet on the ground, go for a walk. I find when I'm angry going for a walk is just about the best thing. The whole story usually changes during the walk. My partner knows if I'm angry about something and I go for a walk, the story will be different when I come back. It won't be the same story I left with. I don't get angry at him that often. <laughs> I don't want to give him the, the wrong impression there. We've been together 23 years. We've worked out most of our power struggles. <laughs> so, we, so we allow the heart to have its experience. And then as I was pointing to in the meditation, what I'm so interested in, and which is really the crux of the matter, is how are we allowing it? So sometimes we, we might think we're allowing an emotion, but we're actually kind of doing this around the emotion. That's the rib cage, right? And so how do we relax that so that we're with the emotion like this, right? Holding it like the rib basket. In the rib basket, I often feel like this holding an emotion in a free kind of way, which is freeing the heart, I often um, feel it as expansion. There is an expansion in the heart, the chest, there's room. The emotion has room to be, let's say it's fear. It has room to kind of move around and be, and I'm not doing this to it. Buddhist terms, I'm not identifying with it, or I'm not um, owning it. And yet, I am recognizing it as my experience in the moment. And there's a, you could say, a kind of tenderness to that holding. The awareness has a, a sense of tenderness, that allowing is tenderness. 
It's a subtle maybe kind of tenderness or sometimes it might be stronger. So we practice this like allowing the full range of a human emotion. I'm kind of tending to talk about afflictive emotions, but we also can talk just the same about joy and love and they're a little easier <laughs> to have space around, but we can also get a little bit like this with them. So it's how to hold like that. And so through this, through this exploration of our full humanity, embodied, felt, there's a kind of unbinding that takes place. And it's a mysterious process because the unbinding isn't something that we do. You could say it's something that awareness does or it's something that happens through awareness. But the places that are constricted start to relax. We may feel it in the heart, we may feel it in the mind, we may feel it in the body and the cells. <laughs> this relaxing of those um, prote protective obstructions <laughs> of greed, hatred, and delusion. And, and first of all, it's on more, usually more um, gross levels, but then as we practice and it gets subtler and subtler. And the unbinding gets deeper and deeper. And the freedom of the heart grows. So we start to feel and know that the sense of the heart that's bound and that feel and know the sense of the heart that's unbound, that's free. We explore both. <laughs> you know, we just want the free heart, but that's not how we humans operate, right? So we 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 have the heart that that's entangled and and confined, <laughs> and um, we have the heart that's more open and connected. And we explore both, we allow both. We don't demand, because if we demand, what happens demanding is this. <laughs> so we demand, we just further bind the heart. So we allow. So we, it's about making space. Another way we could say is that we listen. You could call mindfulness listening. There's a receptive quality that unbinds the heart. We're accustomed to demanding and telling the heart how it should be. What's it like to listen? How are you right now? What is the truth right now? How is this right now? Another way I thought of um, wording it recently is um, we rewild our hearts. Do you know what rewilding is? It's a conservation um, method uh, where land that has been dammed up or um, barricaded or, or walls built or whatever, it's, it's land that's been domesticated that's um, allowed to return to its natural state and then there's a trust that th that the natural state will find its balance. So the dams are taken out and maybe native wildlife are reintroduced and then the, the land is um, left to, to find its own balance. And um, maybe we need to rewild our hearts. We, sometimes we overmanage them. We build up walls and tell them um, what to do a lot. Maybe we need to reintroduce the wild animals 
like anger. Maybe you need to let that be there. I know that's not traditional Buddhism. But it's freedom. So we rewild our hearts. And of course, we bring wise attention to this, right? So we start to understand that if we're allowing and making room for an emotion and we're feeding the story, we notice that that isn't so helpful, right? That feeding the story, um, especially with afflictive emotions, tends to um, accent and, and, and make them grow in ways that aren't helpful. So, so then... Um, as I said, we make space for the, um, the, the heart and the emotion in the body. It's safer that way. Doesn't get so uh, um, wild in an unhelpful way. So finding some time to listen to our hearts. I read recently that billionaire Elon Musk schedules his day in five minute blocks. That doesn't leave a lot of time for listening to your heart. Of course, maybe that wouldn't be our role model anyway, but um, yeah, meditation is time. As, as Ajahn Chah said for this religion of the heart. And in this process, um, like when, when land is rewild, we learn to trust, um, you could say the natural processes of the heart. Carl Jung, the famous uh, psychotherapist, and, uh, analyst, I think analyst is more correct. Um, he said, we must be able to let things happen in the psyche I'm going to say the heart, same. For us, this is actually an art of which few people know anything. Consciousness is forever interfering, helping, correcting, and negating, and never leaving the simple growth of the psychic processes in peace. It would be simple enough if only simplicity were not the most difficult of all things. Because the process I'm talking about, it's so many words, but it's actually really simple in, in um, practice. It's just this attention to what's happening in the moment. With the intention to see where there's obstruction and to feel what leads to freedom. So another way we can talk about like the, the obstructed heart and awareness is that awareness dissolves the obstructions. Not all at once, that would be way too much for us. As I said, it's a wild world. It takes some getting accustomed to this world. <laughs> so, so we honor the protections. We don't try to blast through them, but awareness that kind, gentle, allowing awareness, we start to trust. We could say we trust life or we trust ourselves. We develop verified faith. We start to trust that we have the capacity we have the strength. To be. Vulnerable in this wild world. Vulnerable or open. But able to be touched. Dogen said. That famous um, Zen master. How to find this. I love it. Dogen, I think from like the 13th century Japan. Let things come and abide in your heart. 
Let your heart respond. Let your heart go out and abide in things. Can you hear the openness, the lack of obstruction, the, re the embeddedness, the freedom? Let your heart, let things come and abide in your heart. Let your heart respond. Let your heart go out and abide in things. That was his description of freedom. Because when we can let our hearts be touched by life and when we can touch life, there's no obstruction there. Here's a kind of koan from Katagiri Roshi. I actually love this, but I don't even really know what he's trying to say, but I love it anyway. We sit to settle the self on the self and let the flower of our life force bloom. We sit to settle the self on the self and let the flower of our life force bloom. I can't tell you how, but, but I am talking about that. <laughs> So we develop this trust that that's trusting. Maybe that's what the relationship. We develop this trust in um, in our capacity, verified faith, faith in our capacity to be in this world. But then that really is like trusting life, letting the uh, the how did he say it? Letting the um, flower of our life force bloom. And so we see that our, our, our freedom isn't a process of getting anything. It's not a process of getting to somewhere else, escaping here. It's not a process of masking what's unpleasant or trying to make, you know, cover over and look pleasant and everything look spiritual. <laughs> so it's not awful adding or trying to get anything, but it's more subtraction. We keep subtracting, you could say, what gets in the way of freedom. And actually it's too strong a word to say we do it, we let awareness do it. We just show up. And it's a slow process. It's usually slower than we want it to be. <laughs> and that's why we can appreciate that because um, We humans need time to accommodate to the way things are. And so in the meantime, a little greed, hatred, and delusion kind of keeps things manageable. But over time, over time, patience, tender, awareness, amazing power of mindfulness. Praise the heart. Let's just sit for a couple minutes and we'll see if you have questions or concerns.
Thank you for your attention. Is there anything on your mind, any questions you might have about the talk, the subject matter, something going on in your practice? And um, probably, I think most of you know how to do hands right by now. Oh, Linda, yes, I see you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to know, I'm, I missed understanding the part about what how greed protects us what it protects us from and yes greed think, okay so first of all when we when we when we feel like we want something what happens in the heart and i couldn't find you i want to find you on the screen <laughs> oh well what happens to the heart when we want something it feels like this, right? There's a, right? But if you really listen, so that's one way, it, you know, you can feel the kind of the, the contraction, which is a form of protection. But the other thing about greed that I found really interesting or wanting is it is it, if you listen to the story of it, like the beliefs of, of wanting, or greed, the belief is that you're going to find something that is going to make you happy and it's going to do it. That's what it, that's what it, it it's, it's telling us. Yeah, thank so you. It's yeah, it's protecting us from the truth that that, that, that isn't true, that we can't find um, anything that's going to permanently do it right because everything keeps changing <laughs> so it protects us from the from unsatisfactoriness the truth of unsatisfactoriness does that make sense oh yes definitely and uh, that's a hard one for me <laughs> so i just wanted to <laughs> hear more about it but i'll be watching out <laughs> <laughs> well you know with greed what the truth is that we have to be disappointed many 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 times till we get it and of course, you know, then the conditioning comes back and it's such a habit that it, that it, um, yeah, that we fall for it again and again and again. But, but as we get disappointed consciously, consciously with awareness, awake, we start to erode that conditioning slowly but surely that says this is going to do it for you. If you get that, you're going to be happy. Um, and then we start to have a little bit more flexibility and openness where it's not quite so caught in the greed and we start to have a little bit more ability to choose like what we go after and what we don't because some things might be worth going after <laughs> but but it's not um it's not so compulsive right and on um untamed <laughs> it's too wild it's not so wild um because we, we we start to you know we have like positive skepticism that says um, maybe this won't do it I, like just as a, such a small example but i was mentioning this the other day so i used to back when i went downtown northampton i would um I like to get a cookie sometimes. There was a good cookie that I could get someplace. But over time, I started to really notice that that the cookie didn't do it. <laughs> you know, like when 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 I when they're we're caught in wanting, we're sure that if we eat that cookie, we're really going to be happy. You know, when I say it like that, you might say, "Well, no, we wouldn't really think that." But it's it's subtler than that. It's more it's more like um, deeply buried, perhaps, or it might be actually we might really think that. And so I started to um, not get the cookie, and started to enjoy the sense of freedom of not getting the cookie, because I didn't want the calories, basically. So it was like the calorie. I decided the calories weren't worth that that hit of pleasure that wasn't really going to do it. So that's what I mean by we start to have more flexibility. 
Um, so anyway, it's a great exploration, Linda. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very get, much. Yeah, get disappointed on with full awareness. <laughs> okay. I'll write that down. Okay. Is anybody else that we see here? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I mean, basically, on one level, we could say you're talking about the heart in different states, right? And then you're talking about perhaps certain conditioning that causes the heart to be in a certain state. So the three-year-old has a certain kind of conditioning. There's a condition to, conditioning to protect. And um, we all have that. And it is usually said in young that, that conditioning to want to protect the heart. And depending on, on the environment we grew up in, if the environment isn't so safe, that protection tends to be more dense. And um, mm -hmm. it can feel impenetrable, right? And if the environment we grew up in was safer, maybe not so much, but that's what we learn as a kid, as a young child, is to protect the heart because the world is too wild for, for us. So we protect the heart um, through that. And then there's other parts of you. It, I mean, that's one way of wording it. There's other parts of you that, that feel freer, that don't feel the need for that much protection. And, and the heart feels um, more open. And in some ways, it's probably the same as your therapy is we want to accept it all as it is. Mm. We don't demand that the three-year-old quit being a three-year-old. <laughs> we don't say to that three-year-old, look, you got it all wrong <laughs> and, and uh, go away. And, you know, I don't want you to be like that. You're ruining my life. I mean, we can think that, right? We think that when our hearts close, we, we, we can be kind of mad at it and we can... Mm. Um, and we can say, wait a moment, you're ruining my life. Stop it. Like, open. <laughs> um, it doesn't work very well, does it? <laughs> no, it's, it's very Buddhist in that sense oh, of, um, of uh, accepting everything that's there, but not necessarily the role it's playing at the moment. Yeah. Well, then what we do learn, as I said, or what awareness learns is some flexibility, right? But it doesn't come through trying to get that it doesn't come through bossing our heart around and telling it how it should be it comes through something much more tender mm. and allowing and then yeah sometimes the heart's open and we get to know what that's like too and we can get to trust that more right by experiencing it with mindfulness, trust it more. But it's slow because we all have that three-year-old. It's and 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 that's okay. We we really appreciate that three-year-old heart. <laughs> it's done a good job. <laughs> and um and yeah, I, I, I sincerely mean that. Mm -hmm. And um yeah. It's another, I have, a, I have a high respect for that form of therapy because I, um, it, it introduces and brings about flexibility, which is really another word for freedom. We want flexibility in our heart and our minds. We don't want to be um, trapped or um, bound by our conditioning. And so this ability, this to recognize, first of all, we want to recognize, bring awareness to the conditioning, and then we start to learn how we can play with it. Now, that's what I like to do. I like to play with my conditioning <laughs> as much as I can. I get caught in it sometimes, just like everybody else does. Um, but but when the capacity's there, we start to, um, I'm trying to, to figure out how, what I mean by play with it. It's hard to explain, but um, I, tr I, I like to do something unexpected or um, befriend it, that's playing with it. Mm -hmm. 
laugh with it. Poke fun at it. <laughs> it's all, it's all, um, it's, it's actually like the, the path is, is a freedom, the playing with it. The, mm -hmm. So that's what I like about internal family systems is you're, 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 you're letting things kind of open up. Right? Yeah. I mean, I've never done it, but my understanding is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's what happens, yeah. Sometimes yeah, certain kinds of psychotherapy are such a great balance for um, our practice because they can help um, loosen, loosen. We're trying to loosen things mm -hmm. and certain kind of somatic experiencing, internal family systems, um, any of these kinds of therapies. Talk therapy, uh, it can be helpful for problem solving, but I, I don't know how much it frees. I, I'm more into body-based or um, intuitive. The, the internal family systems is pretty intuitive to me. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, start, we want to air things out. We want room for things to move and reorganize. And talk therapy, there's always a risk that we're just we're doing the same thing as our minds do when they just go, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are good therapists who do good talk therapy. I'm not, but we don't want to kind of um, entrench things further. That's the risk with therapy, right? Is entrenching things further. We want the kind of therapy that opens things up more and moves them and brings in flexibility. Thank you. Nobody's ever responsible for your feelings. So that's the, just, that's the bigger, <laughs> the bigger um, framing. Um, and there are times, you're right, where what is wise is to um, suppress an emotion. That's what you're talking about. You want to know how to suppress it, right? Yeah. Um, When we are able to give room to it, sometimes that makes it easier to suppress it when we do need to suppress it, right? Like grief, oh, grief, yeah. I feel like there's so much that I don't know about your question. And, and, and so I feel like I, I don't wanna say too much. <laughs> Um, we're a culture that doesn't have a lot of tolerance for grief and that's really hard on people who are well, grieving. Well, I could say one more thing. It, it has to do with um, being a white skinned person in a situation with people of color where it isn't appropriate for me to be venting my feelings about something, uh, even though, you know, and I'm being, these are my words, I'm being sort of put in my place or told that there are limits on what I should be doing. And it feels hard. And, and so, you know, I don't want to be like, wow wow you know this hurts this that's not the place to to run my feelings somehow so right, it's like right. yeah Does that well that's one of the yeah I'm, that's one I'm of sure. the great things that's one of the great things about having white um only space is that there's room for that right so there's a place for that that we can explore it in more depth and um it sounds to me like you're trying to be wise about what's appropriate in a situation. And that, you know, that's a kind of, that's a sampajana, clear comprehension. It's a kind of mindfulness that the Buddha talked about, which is awareness of an environment and what's appropriate. So definitely, yeah, it's good. I think our exploration of race is is very young in our in our 
communities in our, um, especially for white people. And um, we're learning so much and there's so much more to learn. It's so, it's so evolving, I would say. Like, how do we have these kinds of conversations? How do we share? What do we share? What do we not share? Um, what's respectful? It, it's, 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 it's evolving. We're trying to learn, right? And what I hear is that you're trying to take care. I also hear that it's difficult, right? You're also saying that, yeah. Yep, it's uncomfortable and difficult and confusing. And um, I think if we're gonna, that when we step into these conversations, we actually have to expect all of that. And know that we're strong enough and we can do it. That we can take the, the discomfort that we can. That's the other thing I think I wanna say maybe to end. I hope there's nobody waiting. Let me just see if there is. Oh, Carol. Okay, Carol. We'll have a couple of minutes, and then I'll end. I don't. I don't have to say anything. You all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. No problem. I think the other thing in this um, exploration of the heart is really learning how how strong we are. I think we underestimate ourselves sometimes, and we and we keep um, our hearts um, under control. <laughs> Um, because we're afraid, we're afraid of, of what we might feel like that we won't be strong enough. And what we learn is that we are strong, that we can hold this full range of what it means to be human, all of it, the joy, the sorrow, the comfort, the grief, the love, the, the, sorrow. Practice helps us know that, remember that. And then also we can call it forth. I call it a kind of fierce compassion. It's a kind of compassion that that's like, I can, I won't be crushed by this, or I won't collapse into this. I can hold this. I can be here. And, um, it's good to remember that because sometimes we underestimate ourselves. That wasn't specifically for you, Paula, but it sounds like you could resonate. It was actually for everybody. But I'm glad you resonated. Well, another fine way to spend an evening talking about Dharma and freedom. I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate the uh, questions. Um, and I don't know if you guys usually end with any words. Shall we usually say something at the end? Well, if I could just make a, an announcement about how Donna works at Common Ground, that would be great. But before I do that, Rebecca, thank you once again, just for <clears throat> offering the Dharma in such a real, accessible, embodied way and modeling what it's like to really be um, so sincere about questioning questions right like oh just I could feel that when you were moving your body in such a way like you that you really learned that because you were with the questions how does this work how does it work to free the heart so thank you for so beautifully model modeling that for us tonight again <laughs> and you you might know already the way common ground operates um and, and if you don't, Common Ground operates exclusively on this practice of generosity. And so when people like Rebecca come and just give so freely without any strings attached, she just shows up and offers the Dharma without any expectations, then we get to respond to that in a way that makes sense in our lives. And um, we can offer something back to Rebecca tonight to support her livelihood. 
and uh, Common Ground donates two thirds of the contributions directly to Rebecca so she can pay her electricity, so she can eat, so she can continue to travel and share the Dharma, pick up her plane tickets when she needs to and so on. So if you'd like to be a part of that wheel of giving and receiving, I posted a, a link in the chat, you can click right on it and make your contribution. Make sure to designate it to Rebecca Bradshaw and we'll be sure she gets it. So thank you so much, friends. Thanks, Rebecca, again. Thank have you. a wonderful retreat with TCVC, the community there. I'm sure some of you will be on that retreat. I think Gabe will be in. He's here tonight. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, most of you probably do, but in a couple of weeks, um, uh, Twin Cities for Pasna Collective it will be sponsoring an online retreat with me and Chaz de Capua five-day retreat. I, I can't remember the exact day it starts. I think September 18th or something. September, February 18th or something like that. But I'm sure you can find it, the information. It's on the TCBC website. Take All right, good friend. care. Bye-bye. <laughs>